Hello, my name is Isha. I'm an officer for United Under Arts, and I will be hosting the webinar today. Today, our guest speaker is Dominique Kim, and she'll be discussing her experiences with the Harvard and New England College Conservatory dual degree program, as well as giving advice on how to compile a music portfolio and her experiences being a professional musician. Please make sure to keep yourself muted while Dominique is speaking and put any questions you have into the chat or send them directly to Dominique. She'll be answer the, answering them at the end. If you prefer to unmute to ask a question, please wait till the end. And now I'll be turning it over to Dominique. Thank you for speaking today. Hello, thank you for your introduction. Um, all right, let's see. Okay, let's see. So, um, I don't know how many of you are thinking about going into music as a career or if you uh, mostly want to kind of pursue it as an extracurricular in college. So I hope I can um, kind of cover both grounds. Um, so a little bit about me. I started on the piano and then I started the flute a little later and then eventually just focused on the flute. Um, when I got to college, I pretty much just did flute. Um, and I performed a lot when I was younger and I think that helped a lot in um, just learning how to perform with stage presence and talking to audience members, um, that kind of thing. Um, I went to LaGuardia High School and Juilliard Pre-College, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the Harvard NEC dual degree program. It's basically a five-year program where the first four years you're just at Harvard, or you're mostly at Harvard, um, and you take lessons every week and you can also do chamber music at NEC. And then the fifth year um, you're done with Harvard and then you kind of have a compressed one year master's degree program. And that's you um, are full time there and do all the required coursework. Um, and throughout the time at Harvard, you can take electives that you can kind of um, put towards the master's degree at NEC. So if you wanna focus more on performing and playing during that fifth year, you can always take classes um, at Harvard to fulfill certain requirements. And then after I was done with the program, I didn't feel ready to leave NEC and Paula Robeson, my teacher. So I stayed an extra year and did a graduate diploma. Um, and now I'm at Rice, the Shepherd School of Music, where I'm studying with Leon Bicey. Um, so a little bit about the college music supplements. I don't know exactly, obviously, what they're thinking, but um, I think some important things to keep in mind is that the admissions office will see the music supplement and then they'll probably pass it to the music department so that an actual musician can review your tapes. And it is just one part of a more holistic process. And it's an opportunity to show, you know, how talented and um, how dedicated you are to your instrument. And it's good is that, you know, you have um, a high level of dedication, a lot of passion, um, any leadership skills that you might have gained through um, your music extracurriculars. And in your actual application, you can kind of buttress this by highlighting um, community engagement programs or volunteer work that you did through music or if you had any leadership positions in a youth orchestra that kind of thing um, and then once the music department gets the tape sorry that's my dog um, your tape will probably be reviewed by either the orchestra director or one of the faculty um, and they basically just say like, yes, this student is very, a very strong musician or, you know, they, it's more of a hobby, that kind of thing. And they try to gauge, um, they, yeah. So they just want to tell the admissions office, like how serious you are about music. And one thing about applying, um, and visiting colleges, if you can visit the college, um, it wouldn't hurt to figure out when they do orchestra rehearsals or choir rehearsals or whatever you would be interested 
in being involved with and visiting um, during one of the rehearsals, checking out the rehearsals, maybe meeting the conductor and any of the students if you want to ask them questions. Um, I personally didn't do this, but when I got to college, I realized that many people did do that. So either way, I think you'll be okay. <laughs> um, and for the actual supplement, I would make sure to check the college's requirements because a lot of the colleges might have different requirements. Um, they might have different time limits. Um, and some of them might not want you to turn in video, that kind of thing. So just make sure you pay attention to those details. And um, as far as repertoire choices, I would choose pieces that you um, are very good at, obviously. But you know, if you don't feel like you have to include a Bach or Mozart, if, if that's not your strong suit, I wouldn't include that. I would try to play to your strengths as a musician um, and then also offer contrasting pieces so that they can tell kind of your range as a musician. Um, for example, for my piano supplement, I turned in a Bach prelude and fugue, and then I turned in the Schumann and Beg variations. And for flute, I think I did a Mozart. And a French, more modern piece. Okay, so then once you get to, oops, that's not the right page. Okay, um, my biggest struggle kind of was obviously finding the time to practice between all the classwork and any other extracurriculars. So if you can right now, kind of figure out your work habits and see what works for you, that would be really good. Um, I think in high school, I was really bad at practicing actually, and um, my mindset was more like, how can I fill three hours of practice rather than how can I be most efficient with my time and um, kind of problem solve more efficiently. Um, and I put this little tomato thing here because this is a technique I learned recently. Um, you guys might already know what this is, but it's basically the Pomodoro technique where you um, set a timer for like 25 minutes to really, really, really concentrate and focus on something. And then you get a five or 10 minute break so give yourself time to just rest, really concentrated practice. You'll find that it's very, very mentally taxing and physically tiring. So um, it's important to take these kinds of breaks. And that's just something that worked for me. Um, you probably you might have different um, work habits and might find techniques that work for you. Um, and another thing that I found really helpful was to have a practice buddy because sometimes it's very hard to motivate yourself to go practice, but if you can kind of link it with um, You know, if you say, oh, let's go practice for how many of our hours social, um, you might feel more inclined to practice more. Um, and yeah, so just mindful practicing. Um, I think I got a lot more efficient in practicing because I had to squeeze a lot of my practicing into very, very short periods of time. Um, and I kind of figured out ways for myself, like what's the best way to practice something, what's the best way to approach how to learn a new piece for a lesson, that kind of thing. Um, and I also found that whenever I was practicing, I felt like I wanted to be doing my schoolwork. And then when I was doing my schoolwork, I felt like I wanted to be practicing. So I tried to kind of hack into my brain and um, I found a space that I could both practice and do work without you know, taking away someone's practice room and doing work in a practice room. Um, and I was able to kind of rotate between practicing and working and I found that helped a lot for me. Um, so if you can you know, explore what spaces are available to you to do your work um, and get creative, that can be very helpful. And Another thing that was very important for me to realize is to set goals for yourself. I used to really, really hate competitions because um, I didn't really like the idea of, you know, like competing against other people. And then when you don't win, you feel bad about yourself, all that kind of stuff. But at the time, I didn't realize that it's an important goal post for yourself and to be able to compete with yourself. And, you know, from learning music for a competition and entering a competition, you learn a lot about, you know, how you practice best, um, how you work under pressure and that kind of thing. So I would, if it's available to you, enter competitions, um, 
If you want to take orchestral auditions, you can try doing that too. It's never too early to start getting into that kind of um, mindset, I think. And then take advantage of any performance opportunities that you might get. Um, there might be like yearly music department recitals or you can uh, schedule and plan your own little cafe recitals for just you and your friends. Um, it's always just helpful to play for other people. And then lastly, um, I would be realistic and not try to do everything you want to do. Obviously, there's like so many things that you want to do in college, um, but eventually you will just get burnt out and then hate everything and not want to do anything. So you can use freshman year to kind of gauge, you know, how much you can handle, um, how many courses that you can handle with the extra time that you need for rehearsal and practicing and lessons and that kind of thing. Um, because you don't want to be in a situation where you're you can't do everything that you signed up to do and then you kind of have to drop things and then disappoint people or you know just it's not great to get yourself to that point um so you can use yeah freshman year and even sophomore year um a lot of people are in the same boat even if they're not doing music you know like athletes um they have a lot of time commitment to their sport. Um, so you're not alone in trying to figure out how to manage your time. Um, and then, so yeah, I didn't always know that I wanted to do music. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor when I was growing up and I entered college as a pre-med. And then after a year, I kind of realized I wasn't actually that interested in becoming a doctor. It was more, you know, how do I make my parents proud? And that's kind of, I think, what they wanted for me. Um, and I also just didn't like the pre-med culture um, in college. So I actually switched majors to art history. And um, for a while, I wanted to be an art historian or a music museum educator or curator. Um, and then one year, I thought I really wanted to be an architect. So I shadowed an architect for a little bit and then saw that that's probably not for me either. Um, I think my junior year, I thought I was um, really sure about going to kind of the publicity or marketing world. Um, I did an internship at a tech startup um, and it was a really good experience and I learned a lot, but it wasn't something I wanted to do forever. Um, and then senior year, I finally came to the realization that my favorite thing during college was playing in the orchestra. Um, and so I finally made my way back to music, kind of a big circle. Um, and I'm just mentioning this because it's totally okay to not be sure what you want to do, um, especially before you even get to college. And then even during college, um, it may seem like a lot of people kind of have this set path, you know, pre-med, pre-law, or if they're going into consulting, um, it may seem like it's there's like a few specific kind of roads to success, um, but really everyone's journey is different, um, which I know is very cliche, but it's important to realize that. Um, and especially when you're comparing yourself to others, which, which is usually very unproductive, um, just remember that, you know, everyone can find their way on their own and using their own interests and that kind of stuff. Um, and on that note, I would try to take time to explore anything that you're interested in. Um, I started taking German freshman year just because I wanted to start a new language. And then that actually ended up becoming my minor. Um, I also got to study abroad the summer after my freshman year in Germany, and that was an amazing experience. Um, and I recommend if you can study abroad for any amount of time, um, I would definitely look into that because um, you kind of meet a lot of, you meet a lot of new people and then you live in country where um, you're different from everyone else. So it kind of opens your eyes to, um, and then I would also figure out what worked for you, what didn't, what you really enjoyed, um, and then kind of your goals going forward. Um, 
I think just writing down goals even makes them much more tangible and you're more likely to act on that goal. Um, and finally, I highly encourage you to talk to your parents, your mentors, your friends. Um, everyone struggles with some kind of, um, I wouldn't say career crisis, but you know, not everyone is sure what they want to do and you're not alone in that. Um, so I would definitely also consult kind of the career services. They have a lot of resources for you. Um, even if you just want to chat um, about, you know, what your, uh, what your values are in a job, what you want your life to look like, that kind of thing. Um, and if you have any older, uh, older friends, you can also ask them, you know, what did they learn freshman, junior, freshman, sophomore, junior year, if they have any advice, um, that kind of thing. Um, so moving on to kind of my work experience relating to music. Um, in high school, I did the Lincoln Center Chamber Music Society Student Producers Program. Um, and this was kind of my first time going into the more administrative side of a music organization. And it was, um, I learned a lot about, you know, what goes behind planning events, reaching out to artists, um, and then even just executing the events, you know, ordering postcards, ordering publicity materials, that kind of thing. And then in the, at the Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra, I applied to be the publicity director. And that was also kind of a similar, and it was also a really good way to be more involved in the extracurricular activities and kind of be more involved in the community. That's actually, that was a big thing that I enjoyed about the orchestra was that um, not only did we play a lot of really, really great rep, but it was a really close community because we were, we kind of all understood each other's lives as musicians. Um, we had a lot of things in common, that kind of thing. And then I think my junior year, I did a January winter internship. It was a one month unpaid internship at the Boston Baroque. And I basically researched um, how other organizations used online streaming material to kind of um, buttress their other content and um, reach new audiences, engage with their donors and, and existing audiences. Um, and I took their data from their radio station and I you know, figured out what time people were listening, what days, what kinds of things were most popular, that kind of thing. Um, and this was my first time getting into more analytic, analytical, um, like Excel kind of stuff. Um, and it was a kind of, it was a low stake program. Um, and so it was a good opportunity to just try out a lot of things. Um, and this, I, this opportunity I found through the career services. Um, again, a very, very good resource. The Asians that are looking for help or um, local organizations that are offering these kinds of internships. Um, and then that summer, I actually the summer before I worked abroad. So I worked in the Center of Digital for Digital Arts and Media in Germany as a Music Institute intern. So I just kind of helped out with um, anything that they needed help out with um, classic intern duties. Um, and this was an unpaid internship, which would have been impossible to do without the grant that I got. Um, so this is another kind of thing. If you have an unpaid internship before you, or if you want to spend your summer doing volunteer work, um, I would look into any opportunities to apply for a grant because they might be able to fund your, um, your work if it's not paid or if it's volunteer. And this also I got from being more involved in the German department which was a pretty small department. So they can offer more attention and time to their students because there are not that many students. Um, that's a plus side of a smaller department. And of course, a bigger department, um, the plus side is you probably get more resources. There's more money for research and grants and that kind of thing. So whatever departments you're involved with, try to play to those strengths and um, soak up 
anything that you can from them. And then my senior year, I um, got a research fellowship through the Radcliffe Institute, and I was a research assistant to Jeremy Eichler, who is a Boston Globe arts correspondent. Um, and this was a really interesting project for me because I was able to um, kind of use and help out with research things that also related to music. So it kind of bridged an academic and musical side of what I was doing in school. And a lot of it was compiling primary documents, reading letters from composers, finding dates, um, pictures, recordings, that kind of stuff. Um, mostly about music written during and after the war, uh, the Second World War. And again, this is a kind of thing where you have to be on the lookout for opportunities. Um, and yeah, the Radcliffe Institute does a lot of, ha has a lot of traveling scholars that they invite to come and do a big fellowship. And so they're are probably similar things in other colleges where you can work with a scholar from, you know, who's not necessarily attached to the school, but if you're interested in working with them, you should definitely try to look into these kinds of opportunities. Um, and then kind of more of the music performance experiences. Um, these are the festivals kind of that I did um, that really prepared me to be a professional musician. Uh, Eastern Music Festival I did in high school and it was the first time I was able to fully devote my entire time to music because obviously during school you have to do your classes and all your other things. Um, and it was a really great way to just focus on the flute and hone the craft, that kind of thing. And then the New York String Orchestra Seminar is a winter festival in New York, and you get to work with um, really, really, really great soloists. I know him, but he conducts the orchestra, and then you get to perform. The, you have sectional rehearsals. Um, Frank Morelli, who's the one in the left picture, he plays in the Met, and so you get opportunities to learn from the top of the field. Um, and then I attended Music Academy of the West, where, again, similarly, you just devote all of your time to practicing rehearsals, orchestra, chamber music, that kind of thing. And I, at the time, I felt like I was the worst flutist there, which I think is actually a really good thing to be. Um, it's a good situation because you can learn so much from the other flutists, the other instrumentalists. Um, that's where I really, really honed my orchestral playing and my chamber playing, um, that kind of thing. And I also want to say that these are the festivals and stuff that I got into, obviously, but there are so many that I did not get into. I got rejected from many other festivals. Um, I applied to Music Academy of the West four or five times before I finally got in. Um, so this is another reason not to compare yourself to other people because you only see their successes and you don't see you know, all the rejections and all the struggling that they also do. Um, and a general thing to always remember is to always be professional, even at festivals. Um, you know, you're with your peers and everyone's around the same age, but eventually they'll become your colleagues um, or even maybe your boss or, or somebody that's going to be on the audition committee for an audition that you're taking. So you always want to be professional and courteous and always be musically prepared. Obviously, practice your part, look at the score, figure out how your part works with the other parts. Um, and then always bring a pencil like this seems very obvious, but some people don't bring pencils and it it's just not a good look. <laughs> um, and also a positive attitude. No one wants to play chamber music or orchestra with somebody who is constantly complaining or, you know, who isn't open to trying out new things. Um, and after the gig or after the festival, 
people will, will remember you um, for what kind of energy that you put out. They might not, they're probably not going to remember the mistake you made in whatever piece or, you know, how well you played um, both in the concert. Um, so that's kind of something important to keep in mind. Also, um, you never know when a teacher or a mentor figure can become your peer. So it's also obviously important to be respectful of um, any coaches, teachers, um, be respectful of their time, their opinions. Um, in pre-college, I had a substitute chamber coach and she ended up being on a panel for one of the auditions I took. Um, so it's a pretty small world, especially the world of music. So um, just keep in mind that, you know, even one person might know another person and then um, be able to make connections for you or recommend you for something. Um, and in general, you know, you just want to be an enjoyable person to be around, um, not just for, you know, what they can do for your career. And then one thing that I want to mention about these festivals is that um, obviously the best, one of the best parts is learning from the best teachers, um, the best conductors, that kind of thing. But um, you have a lot to learn from your peers, but you also have a lot to learn from teachers that are not necessarily your instrument. So if you can go to other master classes, like at Music Academy of the West, I try to go to a lot of vocal master classes because I think there's a lot of connection between, you know, opera and singing to the flute or piano master classes. Any master class um, that you're interested in, you should just go. Um, and any instrument, anyone good at any instrument can be inspiring to you. They don't necessarily have to play your instrument. Um, and kind of on the same note, if you can reach out to another instrument, an instrumental teacher, I would see if they have time to, to hear you play. Um, it can be really valuable to play for a teacher who doesn't play your instrument because they can point out things that, you know, um, that might not occur to your instrument or they can offer a different perspective and, and they can also offer you the perspective of somebody sitting on an audition, an orchestra audition panel. Um, because when you take an orchestra audition, there's probably only going to be one or two of your instrument in the panel and then everyone else is going to be different instruments so it's important to play for other instruments um, and see you know what kinds of things that they're looking for what they're listening for what they notice and what they don't notice um, that kind of thing i don't know if anyone is trying to go into orchestral um, playing it's a very specific and niche field and you know there's a lot to say about doing auditions and that kind of stuff so i won't go too much into that um, so aside from those experiences, the professional experiences, I label as just anything you're getting paid for. So, um, I've been doing a lot of substitute playing in orchestras in the past couple years. Um, the first audition I took actually was my most successful one. And then it's pretty much been <laughs> downhill from there. But, um, the first audition I took, I was the runner up for the position. So I automatically became on the top of their sub list. So I was able to get work while I was in school um, and play with them. And then another in Houston, um, they sometimes have specifically substitute list auditions. So they'll hold auditions for anyone who's interested on in being the substitute list. Um, and since I made the list, I was able to perform two cycles with them. Um, and then another um, substitute opportunity that I got was because I have kind of a solid professional network um, and here to play a really big piece and he wanted to make sure that, you know, he got along with the person who was going to play second flute to him and someone that he musically to prepare um, um, and then as a professional musician you'll probably do a lot of random gigs um, the picture that I put on the right is uh, 
gig that I did at the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts at Harvard. And I just put it there because it's a fun picture, but also um, it's just a reminder that not all gigs are going to look like, you know, playing chamber music in, you know, for a group muse or, you know, playing in an orchestra, that kind of thing. Sometimes um, you'll be offered a gig to play in, you know, restraints and then be like tied to a rope. Um, and it was part of a visual art project. So it was actually a very interesting gig to do. Um, but I, I would say if you're debating whether or not to take a gig, think about if, um, if it's obviously good pay, if it's going to be a fulfilling and enjoyable experience, um, you know, if it's really good music or you really like the people that you would be playing with, um, and if it will do something good for your career, um, if it satisfies at least two of the three, I would say yes. And then if it's only one of the things, I would maybe not take it unless it's really, really good pay. Um, but even if it's really good pay and it's not an enjoyable experience, that can just be, that can be a bummer. And, you know, it's not nice playing music when it's not an enjoyable experience. Um, so yeah, there, there are gonna be a lot of different kinds of gigs. Um, I played for the opening event for one of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum's um, new exhibitions. And um, I think I did two events there and that is the kind of thing where, you know, if you're open to doing new things and you put your name out there, people will notice you and ask you you know, to do a gig or they'll think of you to do a gig. Um, and then teaching is a really good experience, not just, you know, as another source of income, but when you teach, you have to articulate, you know, what you're doing to make a certain sound or uh, you have to help your student be creative about ways to practice and just having to communicate this can be a really good exercise. Um, and figuring out exactly how to put to words, you know, like how you make your sound, how you articulate things, you know, all the specific instrumental stuff that may, might come naturally to you, or maybe it doesn't. Um, it's always good to be able to express how you're doing things and why also. And then outreach is a big part of what, or I like to do a lot of outreach. Um, and I think it's important to, you know, give back to the community, try to, um, you know, help build audiences for the next generation, that kind of thing. Um, I did some outreach at Rice last year where we would go to a school and I performed as a wind quintet and we would do instrument demonstrations, um, make silly noises with the instruments to kind of, you know, entertain the students. Um, it's very fulfilling to just see kids be, uh, be curious about what you do because sometimes you can get so caught up with, you know, the technique and making recordings, competitions, that kind of thing. It can be very refreshing to see, you know, how kids respond to your playing. Um, and lastly, this is, I would say um, I would want this to be my biggest takeaway is to follow your curiosity. Especially if you're not sure what you can kind of try out a lot of different things in the moment, but eventually you'll find something that you really enjoy. And it's also important to figure out what you don't like as much as things that you do like. Um, and, you know, trying out new things, new experiences, new hobbies can teach you a lot about yourself. Um, especially if you're kind of a creative person, um, sometimes if you're doing an assignment or a project on a deadline or you know for someone else, it can become a stressful endeavor um, and you might not go about executing it in your most ideal way. You know, you might be crammed for time, you might not be excited about the material, that kind of stuff. But if you're doing a project just for your own interest and enjoyment, um, you can kind of go about the project in the way that your mind naturally wants to work. And I think that 
that's an important way to figure out how you best work, um, you know, in ideal circumstances. And then you can try to apply that to your assignments, your projects, things that, you know, you have to do. Um, and kind of on that note, it's very important to play and explore, um, especially, you know, when you feel really stressed for time, it can feel like you should just, you know, work, 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 um, but eventually you will burn out. Um, and if you set aside, you know, an hour or two a week to just concentrate on doing something fun, it gives your brain a chance to recharge. Um, you can kind of um, engage the other side of your brain. Um, I know there's a lot of like pseudoscience about right and left side of your brains, but um, I do think there are like creative muscles that you're not always using when you're practicing, for example, versus when you're exploring something new. Um, it's kind of like cross training, I think. Um, and new, you know, learning new things, trying out new languages or anything, it can open up a lot of avenues and opportunities. Um, I mentioned that I just started German and then because I kind of continued with it, that I was able to study abroad and even work abroad. Um, and, you know, I, at the time, I had no idea that that's what I would end up, would end up doing. But um, in the end, I think those were my most valuable and cherished memories and experiences. Um, and through, you know, following new hobbies, trying out new things, you can gain a lot of skills. And as a freelance musician, which is what I currently am, it's important to have a lot of different skills, um, you know, video editing, audio editing, um, working with microphones, um, even marketing and publicity things, uh, um, just anything that you can do to become independent and, you know, build your skill set should definitely go for it. Um, yeah. And, I forgot to mention this, but my the way that I kind of went about deciding if I was going to pursue music full time. Um, I during college, I was surrounded by a lot of people who um, were very, very, very serious about music and they probably were more focused on their music than the academics. And if you already know that you want to do music, then that's probably what you should do. And that's totally, that's good for you. But I wasn't sure. And so I always felt, you know, kind of unsure of my own status as a musician, because I thought, oh, I'm not taking it as seriously as all these other people. And I'm doing all these other things. So maybe I'm not cut out to be a musician, or maybe, you know, this is a sign that I don't want to do it. But since I had that fifth year at NEC, I gave myself kind of a deadline. So I um, went into that year thinking, okay, I'm going to commit fully and act like I'm going into music and see what happens. Um, cause I think I just needed to prove to myself that I could do it and that I wanted to do it. Um, and a lot of good things happened that year. So I, um, felt more confident in my decision about going into music and also, because I had spent four years exploring a lot of different other things and kind of trying to keep my options open. Um, I could have tried to take orchestra auditions and went an orchestra to conservatory after high school are missing this opportunity for exploring um, and, you know, trying new things. And a lot of people, you know, at Curtis Juilliard at top conservatories, they go through this kind of existential crisis where they wonder like, do I really want to do this? Am I only doing this because this is the only thing I'm good at? Um, and you can feel a little stuck if you go straight to conservatory. Um, so I'm really glad that I ended up choosing Harvard NEC rather than going to conservatory because, um, you know, at the ultimately, I could be much more sure of myself going forward. Um, and obviously, you meet a lot of fun and interesting people and you can learn so much from your peers. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to push you away from going to conservatory if that's if you're sure about that. 
but if you're kind of on the fence, I would definitely recommend going to somewhere where you can explore a lot of other things too. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. Yeah. Thank you for listening. And I hope that that was helpful in some way. Um, you guys are probably smarter than I was at your age. So this might be stuff you already know. Um, but if you guys have any questions about, you know, specifically like orchestral auditions, I can talk a lot about that. Or if you have any other questions on what I talked about already, um, I'd be happy to answer that. Okay, we're gonna start our Q&A portion then. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, I believe. So if you can see those, you can answer them. Oh, yeah. no. Um, so the first question was, how do you cope with performance anxiety or perfectionism during recording? Mm. Um, so for performance anxiety, the best way to cope with that is just to practice performing a lot because like basically no matter what you do, you will get nervous. Um, your heart will, your heartbeat will raise, um, you might shake. Um, and the best thing to do is to just practice being in that state um, so that you at least know like what your body, how your body's going to react. And then you can figure out ways you can combat that. Um, recording is something that I'm struggling with too. Um, well, another thing about being nervous is just try to remember that being nervous is a good thing. It means that you really care, you know, um, and just try to use that energy to connect with the audience, um, you know, take risks while you perform, that kind of stuff. And then for recording, it's an ongoing struggle, but I try to, um, you know, be very like work out, make sure your body is loose and warm. And then the best way to prepare for an audition for recording is obviously being prepared. If you are unsure of one thing even that can, you know, just make the whole process even more stressful than it needs to be. So assuming that you're all prepared and ready to go, um, I would, what I do is I just take my first take with no, you know, expectations. I just let myself play through it. And then the second take, I try to um, take more risks and try to try to play like I'm performing for an audience um, because I know I'm going to take another take where I'll maybe be a little bit more careful and um, just knowing that you have another take that you can do another take can make the second take more relaxing and personally I play much better when I'm relaxed that's probably the case for most people um, so if you know you you know, have time for another take. And if you know that your first take was fine, um, then you can do your second and third take even um, in a more relaxed way and just, you know, just playing and remembering that music is, you know, supposed to help you connect to people. And yeah, you don't have to worry so much about being technically perfect that way. Um, yeah. I always find that my second take is better, is the best. <laughs> Cause after third, fourth, fifth take, you just get tired and it doesn't sound good. <laughs> um, the second question was, what do you think makes Harvard slash NEC programs stand out from other similar programs? I honestly, I'm not sure. Cause I, you know, didn't do any of those other programs but I do know from people who did the Juilliard Columbia program that um, it didn't feel super integrated. Um, and mm. uh, I and with call it, um, Columbia Juilliard, you can try to do it in four years. I'm not sure like why you would wanna do that, but that's an option that is not an option for NEC, Harvard NEC. Um, Probably if you're trying to decide between certain programs,
I would look at the faculty um, and the orchestra and can't do the orchestra. Like I couldn't play in the NEC orchestra um, because the schedule never worked out. Some people can make it work, but um, it's pretty hard to play in the orchestra because you have to commute. It never works out with your class time. So um, that is another thing you might consider. Um, yeah, just look, considering faculty, you know, I really wanted to study with Paula Robeson and she's at NEC. Um, so yeah, I'm, I don't know. I don't have anything else to add to that. Um, um, our next question was not directly related to um, flute, which you studied, but uh, it was for a classical vocalist, what's the best college program and what are they looking for? I'm guessing the, what are these music programs looking for? If you know anything about that? Is this like festivals or college? College programs. Um, so not conservatory. Um, I, I don't, I don't think I can talk. I don't know a lot about the vocal um, world. And even within the vocal world, I think a lot of different conservatories and colleges are different. And a lot of it is also really subjective. Um, you know, it's obviously up to the teacher's taste because they're the ones that are accepting you. Um, and even something like Harvard NEC, um, like certain instruments are much harder to get in because some of the teachers really don't want to take Harvard NEC students um, because they think, you know, they're not going to practice and they're not going to be as invested in music. Um, so, yeah, I would try to keep in mind, you know, what the teachers what the teachers specifically want. Um, but I wouldn't try to change anything about your playing or singing too much to fit their style or their expectations because then you'll just be stuck trying to change your playing and trying to change yourself into a different musician for four years or whatever. And it's better to go somewhere where you're a good fit with the teacher, um, where your playing or singing is a good fit with their style. Um, rather than trying to change your playing to fit the school. Our next question is, do you have any tips on how flutists or wind, woodwind players should warm up prior to prior to playing? Um, yeah, so I would try to stay active in general. If you can work out for you play. that's obviously like the most so incorporating breathing exercises different stretches and dynamic stretches that you can do to warm up your joints to make sure the blood is flowing that kind of stuff um and actually speaking of warming up and moving around um a, one way that you can prepare for stage fright is doing adversity training so basically you can practice in the dark, um, practice, like do a bunch of jumping jacks, run up and down the stairs, and then try to play the most challenging excerpt um, so that you can train your body to, you know, perform in these adverse circumstances. Um, yeah. Um, our next question is, how does the application process work with two colleges? Is there a joint application or two separate ones? For Harvard NEC, it was two separate applications. Um, and it, even if you got into both Harvard and NEC, it doesn't necessarily mean you got into the program. So that's something to keep in mind. And if you don't get into the program, like that has nothing to do necessarily with your worth as a musician. Um, like I said, some teachers just don't wanna take dual degree students. Um, one of my friends in college didn't get into the program but she is in a grammy award-winning quartet now and you know it's you can no matter what your circumstances ultimately end up being you can make it work um and you know tailor your time there to fit what you want to do um sorry oh the next question was where can i find more information about this program and who can i contact to learn more about it uh, I think the Harvard Music Department website has information about the, the program, and then the NEC website. 
also probably has more information about it, who like who the head kind of of the program is now, but it should list all the information on the page um, and then you can email them or call them um, to talk more about it. You can also try to reach out to the um, the academic advisors at NEC because they have a more specific idea of like what classes you have to take, all the requirements, um, and they also know, you know, what kinds of things past Harvard NEC students did. Um, so, yeah, I would reach out. When you're up against such technically skilled flutish sla flutists slash musicians, how are you able to make your musical interpretations unique and stand out? a good question that's something that everyone like i'm always trying to I'm always trying to you know offer something new and unique um i think something important to keep in mind is that um as long as you're not exactly copying a recording or somebody else no matter what you do it will inherently be kind of unique because it's you doing different records or different instruments um, and that all that kind of stuff informs your playing. Um, and personally, when I'm learning a new piece, I try not to listen to recordings because it's so easy to listen to a recording and be like, oh, I really like that. And then just slap it onto the piece and then just do that. But if you, you know, study the score and try to figure things out on your own, um, you'll probably be more successful in having a more unique interpretation. Um, and I would also record yourself a lot. Um, you can learn a lot by recording yourself um, because you might think you're doing something. And then if you record and listen back, you don't hear like the crescendo or the rubato or whatever. Um, it doesn't come out to the listener. So I would record yourself to kind of gauge what yeah, what things are actually coming through. Can you explain how switching majors works? Mm, this is probably different for every school, but um, you just, it's like paperwork. Basically you have to um, show that you can viably switch majors and finish all your requirements in time. Um, you have to, I think, have your, freshman advisor or some kind of advisor and an academic advisor sign off on it. Um, and I think the advisor of the department you're switching into, you probably need their permission or, you know, their guidance. Um, yeah. Does Harvard recruit musicians, specifically vocalists, like the way they recruit athletes? Or, or I want to make Sorry. Or if they want to major in classical vocal, is that the same as applying to another major, for example, like English? Yes, yeah, so they don't recruit musicians. Um, the whole like athletic recruitment thing is kind of ridiculous in my opinion, but um, they, I guess kind of the equivalent of the recruiting is the music supplement. Um, I know at Harvard, if you send in a music supplement and the conductor really, really, really likes you, um, you know, he'll say to the admissions office, like, I really like the student. I think they're going to be a great addition to the orchestra and to the music culture at Harvard. Um, I highly, highly recommend that you accept them. Um, and you don't really apply to a major. And in, in the application, I think they ask, like, what you think your major is going to be. And I don't think that really matters for the application. Um, and actually at Harvard, you there's no music performance degree. It's only musicology and theory. So it it's not really like going to a conservatory at all. Um, they do have some performance classes, but the focus is definitely on musicology and theory and composition. Is piano included too in the dual degree program or is it just for flutes or woodwind? Yeah, it's all instruments and not even, it's not just classical music either. There's, um, you know, jazz pianists, jazz vocalists. Um, 
new music players, basically any instrument or genre that NEC offers, you can apply to the program with. Um, if anyone else in the call right now has any more questions, they can send them. But if not, there's a couple of questions from people who couldn't come today. For example, have you ever regretted choosing the Harvard NEC dual program? No, I think I feel really good about that decision. Um, yeah, I, it was probably the best thing that could have happened for my music or deciding to go into music. Um, during school, obviously I regretted it just because I was really busy and stressed, but ultimately it was a really good experience. What was your favorite class that you took in the program? My favorite class, um, I probably actually a class that was a gen ed, like a general education core requirement that I just randomly took. It was on American colonial art and art history. And that is the class that actually inspired me to uh, major in art history. Um, I also really like there was a design course that I took. Um, and it kind of it, it was yeah, it was like about experiential design and user experience that I really enjoyed. Um, yeah. Um, did the program or Harvard have any school traditions that you liked? The Harvard itself has a lot of traditions. Um, not so much Harvard NEC, I think, because it's a very small, very small subset of people. I think it's like seven or eight students a year. Um, but, you know, there's ridiculous Harvard traditions like, uh, like when it snows you like take trays from the dining hall and like slide down the steps of the library or there's a thing called primal screen. people like run around naked in the yard <laughs> um and then there's kind of like the checklist of things that you know people will do before they graduate so there's like jumping into the river which i do not advise um, and there's like peeing on John Harvard's statue. Also, don't advise um, that kind of stuff. It's like mostly silly stuff. Um, I, if anyone else has any questions, they can type into the chat. Um, if not, we are almost done. Um, on the screen that I have shared right now, there's a link for you guys to join us at, or you can use this QR code. You can also contact us at info at unitedunderarts.org and follow all of our chapters. I'm going to be sending in a um, link that you guys can all take momentarily. Sorry, um, okay, here. Uh, we, we would really appreciate if you filled out that feedback link that I just sent in the chat. And I wanna say thank you for Dominique for being our speaker today. And we will be posting the recording for this workshop on YouTube and sending it all, sending it out to all of you via email soon. Uh, besides that, have a great rest of the day and weekend, everyone. Bye.